So granddaughter was uh, preparing the ham for Thanksgiving. And, and her daughter saw what she was doing. She took the ham and she cut off the end of it and then put the, the ham in the pan and throw away the part that she cut off. And the granddaughter asked, oh, why, why did you, um, or her daughter asked the granddaughter, uh, why, did, why did you cut off the end of the ham and throw it away? And her mother said, well, let me ask my mother. <laughs> And then she went to the mother and asked, why did you cut off the end of the ham every Thanksgiving and throw the piece away? And then you bake the rest of it. She said, well, let me ask my mother. She went and asked her, mom, why did you cut off the end of the ham every Thanksgiving and throw it away and bake the rest of it? And she said, well, and this would be the great grandmother the great great grandmother she said well i didn't have a long enough pan right. so you talk about influence sometimes we're influenced by the traditions that we keep <laughs> even though we don't know where they originated from but it's tradition so you don't question it you just do it right <laughs> So all those years in that family, a piece of ham has been wasted. Good morning to you and good to be here. Uh, welcome to our visitors. Thank you for choosing to be here with us every Sunday. We get plenty of visitors. Always an encouraging uh, 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 thing for us because, again, I say this in our church family hears this every Sunday, but I mean it. When you come here to Hawaii, you're here on vacation, or maybe work vacation, and you will not go on vacation from the Lord. You're going to be with us and worship God with us, so it's an encouragement to us uh, that you choose to be here uh, with us on the first day of the week. Open your Bibles. Well, before that, let's um, take out our bookmarks. Sorry. And for our visitors, this is something that we do as part of our evangelistic efforts. Uh, we have this bookmark available in the back table, right where the pictures are. Everything on that table is free for members and visitors. And we write 10 names of people that are in our circle of influence, you know, people that that we know have not obeyed the gospel. And we write their names on this, on this uh, bookmark, just 10 names. You got to start somewhere, uh, but 10 names. And you pray for those names specifically, or you pray for them. Uh, you ask God for their hearts to be prepared uh, to receive the seed of the gospel. You ask God to give you the wisdom and the knowledge to share the gospel with them because that's your responsibility as a Christian. Those names are the people that are around you. And if there's going to be uh, someone that will teach them the gospel, it ought to be us, right? It ought to be, it ought to be you. And so prayer helps in evangelism, uh, I believe many of the times I've asked the church for prayers in Bible studies that I've had, those prayers are, are important because prayer is powerful. James tells us that the, the active or effective prayer of the righteous man, it avails much. It accomplishes a lot. And James uses the idea of Elijah prayed for no rain. And there was no rain. And he prayed again for rain, and then there was rain, right? And it's, it's talking about the power of prayer. And so this time, uh, I would like for us to join together in prayer for all the names of the people that are in our, 
our lives that we constantly meet, the people we know. Uh, let's pray together for them and then let's make an effort to teach them the gospel. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for your love and your mercy towards us. In that, Father, you given us the time and the opportunity, Lord, to obey the gospel. And we thank you so much, Father, for the people that you put in our lives that help us to see the truth and to come to the knowledge of it. And we pray, Father, that you help us to be likewise, to, to be those people, uh, to share your word with, with those who are around us. We pray for every single name, Father, that is on our bookmark, the people that are in our lives, Lord, that have not obeyed the gospel. Help us to realize our responsibility to them, Lord, to share the word to them. Help us also to prepare ourselves and to equip ourselves in order to, to do your will, to preach the gospel to every creature and to lead many souls to you. Please be with us now, Father, as we open your holy word. Allow your word, Lord, to mold us into being your children, to mold us into the image of your son, Jesus. Humble our hearts as we receive your word today. Uh, may it benefit us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And then last but not least, happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Uh, you all matter. And what what you do as fathers, what we do as fathers is so important in this world, uh, in this nation, um, in your community, uh, more importantly, in your own home uh, to lead your family uh, to Jesus. And so I've got a message prepared for us fathers uh, today in our sermon. But for Bible class, we're going to continue our study of the book of Acts. So open your Bibles to Acts chapter 7. And we are now at the ending, if you will, the closing part of uh, Stephen's sermon. So first, I want us to go there to Acts chapter 7. And I want us to notice verse 51 through 53. So, again, highlighting the, the care and the love that Stephen had for these people, right? The Jews, his countrymen, his, his people. It would be like me trying to convince the Samoan people to obey the gospel. Or you trying to convince your ethnicity uh, to join or to obey the gospel. That's literally what Stephen is doing here for his people, the Jews. And again, highlighting his love, notice his approach to them, right? In the beginning of the sermon, he started off the sermon with, you know, a history of their nation, history of the Jewish people, beginning from Abraham, the father of faith. Uh, we know that the Jews always made it a point to emphasize them being children of Abraham. Now, some of them even, even try to pull that card with Jesus, right? Those who didn't believe Jesus, they said to Jesus, but we're offspring of Abraham. And Jesus says to them, God can make uh, raise offspring of Abraham from these stones. And if you believe Abraham, you believe me. Before Abraham was, or be, before Abraham was, I am, all right? And so Stephen, he tries to level with his Jewish people, sharing this history up to the point of the building of the temple. Another main thing about the Jewish religion, the temple, the temple. When Jesus said, destroy this temple, we know what he meant because uh, inspiration explains it, that Jesus wasn't talking about the building that was built um, and then uh, renovated by Herod, the temple of the first century. Jesus was talking about himself. He says, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will build it back up. I will raise it back up. And, and the Jews took offense to that. Well, 
how is he going to destroy? This temple has been in building for 46 years. Right? And he says he's going to destroy it. The temple was something the Jews, you know, held on to and even to their demise, held on to tight. <laughs> they denied Jesus in the spiritual uh, temple of, of the church. And eventually in AD 70, that temple was destroyed. And even today in Israel, they still hope for that day when Messiah comes and rebuild again. The temple where the Dome of the Rock stands. All right. So Stephen knew the people. The, the formulation of his sermon was for them, is to help them see, listen, our history points to Jesus as Messiah. But they were not here. And so the sermon takes a turning point. <laughs> This is like the call to action. It's like when after the lesson, it's, it's sort of like the so what of the lesson. Right? So what? Right? That's one of the important things about Bible teaching. What is the so what? Well, Stephen has laid out this history. And then here's the problem with Israel's people. They're hard of hearing. They would not listen and so the sermon takes a turn <laughs> and Stephen will not hold back words and I'd like to read this for us Acts chapter 7 51 to 53 I like to read it the way I think it sounds okay you stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold, uh, who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it All right. this was the disposition of heart when jesus was preaching majority of the crowd stiff neck <laughs> stubborn another word we might put in there stubborn uh hard headed <laughs> uh, another uh term here Basically, they, they, they will not listen to the word of God. I mean, notice verse 54. When they heard this, th these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. I want to, before we get to, to, to their reaction, I want to talk about what Stephen said here. All right. First of all, the tone of what he said. Any problem with the tone? <laughs> Are there uh, instances in our spiritual walk where we need this tone? <laughs> All, right. All right. Often we, we, we view this tone as, well, that's very unkind. All right. Well, that's not very nice. Stephen, man, was, that's not very nice, Stephen. <laughs> All right. part of part of preaching paul paul reveals that and what he said to timothy preach the word reprove rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine are, are there lessons that we need to hear that sometimes step on the toes Yes, it's good for us, All right? And so this, this kind of tone, don't, don't frown upon it when we see strong rebuke being practiced. Um, even with this tone, you can still be loving, can you? All right, parents, have you ever yelled at your kids? 
I have. And sometimes I do it to, to get their attention, to get them to realize, hey, I'm not joking. Right? To help them see, hey, and, and, and I do that, I will strongly rebuke them because I love them. Because I don't want them to, you know, stray from the past. Stephen here loves the people. And so he, he's going to love them truthfully. He's going to tell them the truth. Listen, you don't hear the word of God. How about the very last part? Who have received the law by direction of angels and have not kept it. Find it interesting that verse 54 says, when they heard these things. So all this time, Stephen was talking, right? And then finally, Luke reveals a response. And I have a feeling it's not a response. This response, I have a feeling it's not towards the truth about Abraham. It's not about the truth about Moses and what God did through Moses. Or the truth about David and what David did and Solomon. And it, it, I don't think it's about the truth about their history. I could be wrong. We're not told. But I, but I think they responded to, the, to this because of what Stephen said. You stiff neck. You don't listen to God. And I think when they heard that part. You know, they wanted to. Kill them. We know the end of this story. Eventually, they'll, they'll, they'll kill Stephen over the truth. All right. Go with me to 2 Timothy 4. Christians, we sometimes are very stubborn. We may hear things over and over, but will not keep it. Sometimes church churches are hurt and are divided, not because of people trying to obey the truth. If we try to obey the truth, we'll, we'll be good. But often it's the stubborn ones that create the problems. They will refuse to hear what the word says. Right? Not what the preacher says. What the word says. Paul said this about the coming generations as he warned Timothy, telling Timothy to preach the word. The word which he learned from a childhood. 2 Timothy 3 verse 15. The word that is God spoken, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. The word that equips the man or woman of God to do everything that God has called us to do, 2 Timothy 3, verse 17. And then he says to Timothy, I charge you. Right. Timothy, I, this is something you must do. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Timothy, as you live and as you minister, God knows what you are doing. Who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Timothy, this charge is about heaven or hell. It's about judgment day. And so he says to him, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Heard so many people say that that means to preach it when they want to hear it. Preach it when they don't want to hear it. <laughs> I think it basically says you preach it doesn't matter what time it is. You preach it doesn't matter the circumstances. You preach the word. He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. In preaching, you convince. Right. 
convince the audience about who God is, about what he's done, about our state without Christ, and what we must do to be in Christ. Convince. And he says, you convince in preaching, you rebuke. When there's correction, offer it. Offer it in love. Sometimes offer it in the tone that Stephen offered this correction. All right. Rebuke. The goal of rebuke is to bring back someone to the right way, to the correct path. Convince, rebuke, exhort, encourage, lift up. All right. Strengthen the souls. I think about uh, when Moses uh, had to held up his hands and he got tired. And when Moses would put down his hands, the battle is the, the Israelites were losing the battle against the, 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 the Amalekites. And when he would hold up his hands, they would be winning the battle. And then two people held up Moses' hands when he was tired. That's encouragement. That's the picture of encouragement. Right? Sometimes we need someone to come alongside and say, hey, you got this. We'll help you. Right? We can do this. Exhortation to lift up, to build up. And then in preaching, there is this important part. Patience, long-suffering, and teaching. I remember, uh, I'm, I would say I'm still very new in preaching. But I will say, I, I, I've grown a lot. But I, re, I think back to first years of preaching here. And, and I remember, you know, the, the impatience of, especially when you teach something. And you don't see you don't see it come to fruition right away, <laughs> right? I just did a lesson on this. Did you not get it? That's the, sort of like the idea here. In preaching, you got to repeat things over and over and over and over and wait and wait, all right? You got to be long-suffering. In the teaching of God's word. Now verse 3. What will happen Paul? For the time will come. When they will not endure sound doctrine. That, that time was already in the first century. There was some of that. As Stephen spoke in Acts chapter 7. The Jews will not endure his teaching. All right. To endure sound doctrine is, is to allow it to mold you. To allow it to shape you. To allow the word of God to humble you. Endure it. Listen to it. Apply it. Share it. But a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires... Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. If, if, if you ever decide, you know what, let's, let's hire a new preacher, all right? Pray God, you, you hire someone that will preach the word. That you will not make it about you. Well, what would we like to hear? <laughs> what would we like not to hear? Are there certain things we don't want the preacher to preach on? All right, may never be the case here. They will heap up for themselves teachers having itching ears. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. There are church of, 
churches of Christ today. That now have women elders. You know? <laughs> you go to you go to a certain schools of theology, they'll teach you that stuff. You come out with your PhD in Bible, and you think, you know what? I, I have arrived. I can teach this. That's happening in churches. Schools are producing students. And man, it's going at a fast rate. I'm noticing that left and right church is changing. Women elders, you have to be blind and stubborn <laughs> and stiff-necked to have women elders. Because the Bible says it so plainly, 1 Timothy 3. If a man, well, even, even that, even, even being a man, that's under fire, isn't it? Living in a society that don't know what a man is from a woman or a woman from a man. You have to be stiff-necked, stubborn to go a different way than the Bible way. And so when Paul said this, he, he wasn't talking about the lost people in the world. He was talking about church members. He was talking about Christians. There are times where some will say, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's too strict of a teaching. Let's, let's not follow it. All right. Um, there are those today that, that look at, uh, <laughs> I did a lesson on this, but you spank your child, you, you're doing it wrong. And I, I will say this, that we, we practice spanking in our home. And maybe I've said it's the last resort, but I've learned that it's, it's, it shouldn't be a last resort. <laughs> Here's why. <laughs> there are some situations where you teach after the spanking. Uh, there, there are some situations I've learned that as a parent there's some situation where when it happens I'm like come here and I, I spank them and then I talk to them you know why I spanked you right. so it shouldn't be the last resort but it should be something you use in a godly way because right? it can be overbearing spanking can become abuse and it can be done incorrectly. Some children, uh, six of them, some children don't require spanking. The word, just the words would, would, would work on them. All right. Some children, <laughs> that rod would drive out some of that craziness. <laughs> All right. But there are some today in the church pushing that, that, that theory. You shouldn't be spanking your children. You're doing it wrong. What well, about all the Proverbs uh, that are inspired, that teach us? You spare the rod. You don't love your child. Mm -hmm. And that's the rod there is not just the physical rod. The idea is the rod of instruction. Just if you don't give instruction, you don't love your child. Sometimes the instructions comes in the form of a sasa. Right? Stiff neck, stubborn. Paul says, you preach the word because that time is coming. Um, go with me to Acts chapter uh, 20. One more here, and, and then I'll open up to your thoughts. 
about this stubbornness or stiff-necked people. Acts chapter 20, notice with me verse uh, 29. In verse 28, Paul, to the elders of the Ephesian church at Miletus, therefore take, you, take heed to yourselves, to all the flock, and among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Wow. In the church in Ephesus, there was a lot of warning. What did you say? There was a lot of warning in the teaching. Paul says, day and night with tears I've warned you. Verse 32, so now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are also, or who are sanctified. Any thoughts about what Stephen said or the idea of stubbornness or hard of hearing? Jesus, in his parables, would, would emphasize that. In hearing, they hear, but will not understand. Seeing, they will see, but... but they will not perceive because the heart of this people has grown hard and, and their ears have grown dull. All right. The ground on which the seed of the word of God falls cannot be hard. We see that in the parable of the sower. On the hard ground, it did not grow at all. All right, and that's the, the devil coming in and snatching the seed away. On the distracted ground, the thorny heart. All right. It grew a little bit, but then other things became more important. On the persecuted one or the one that did not grow root. It lasted for a little bit and then they give up. But on the good soil... Jesus said it produces fruit. All right. some, th some 30, some 60, some 100. And so let's not be stiff-necked, <laughs> stubborn against the word of God. Let it correct us. Let it mold us. Let it change us so that we can be more like Jesus. Um, go ahead, Mika. Um, can we get our mic? <laughs> Thank you, Lima. I've noticed since um, teaching the, the gospel, when we come to the point that uh, of uh, showing people the church, and they kind of uh, uh, restructured what they they already heard and when it heated up by the point that we show them the only true church and the only church that will be saved after and they will say things like 
to you people say and think that only the Church of Christ will be saved. They don't want to hear that when we teach them everything that we know to show them the true church and the saint. So they kind of uh, um, telling us, so you guys think that only the church of Christ will be saved. And they kind of think that we are very harsh or strong in telling them what the Bible is teaching. But then I show them what Jesus told the Samaritan woman when the woman said, we worship on this mountain, but you Jews worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus came to save the lost. But he was not whole back when you told the Samaritan woman, you worship, you don't know. So what really Jesus was telling him, you're lost. You do not know what you're worshiping and you do not know what you're doing. So when I tell them that, that that's not what we are trying to do, because even Jesus himself was telling the truth to this woman. And that's when they, they said, I don't want to hear the gospel anymore. But it is good that uh, the lesson is in yeah, this morning about uh, what Stephen had told them straight. And the result was, we know what it is. But it is where we are, we are going. That's what, you know, our work we, we don't have to back off or back down when Christo gospel, when it was heated up to the point that Stephen ended up dying when, when he preached that word. Thank you very much, Lima. Um, I'll go to uh, Lillian. Yeah, often when we um, talk about the Lord's church or his body, uh, it's it's for some people, they just can't, they can't accept the idea of there being just one church. And and it's not like something we came up with. <laughs> All right. It's biblical teaching. Right? There's only one body, the, the Lord's body. Um and and there's only one kingdom, the Lord's church. And the Bible says that then comes the end. When he will deliver up the kingdom, just one, not kingdoms, uh, to the Father. And, and so, um, like Jesus said, it's the narrow way. It's the difficult way. It's the straight gate. And only a few will find it. All right? and, and I've shared this with people. Listen. One church is the narrow way. <laughs> That's the narrow way. There's one church. Now, I can't help you if you think that you can get to heaven any other way. I can't help you. But here's what the Bible says. All right? Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But what does that mean? It means it's in him. It's through him. And it is him. Uh, that that is a reference to not just the idea of his name or his authority. It's a reference to all that he came to reveal. This is the way. Part of what he came to reveal is the kingdom of heaven. That was a, a major point of, of the preaching in the first century. Right? It was talking about repentance and the kingdom. Right? Repent. That's what John the Baptist preached. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus and his disciples, that's what they preach. All right. But for some reason, we've, uh, you know, in the world of Christianity today, people have gotten away from that idea. Kingdom. Which is it? What is the kingdom of God? It's the church. Right. 
and that kingdom will be delivered um, on judgment day. And, and, and sometimes also the way we present it can turn people off, right? Like, like um, when people um, uh, say things like that. So do you think that the church of Christ is the only church going to heaven? You got to be careful how you answer that question. Because you may be right, but your answer may just shut the door to that discussion or may just shut the door to that soul. And so uh, maybe you're thinking, so what should I say when someone asks me that, <laughs> right? I say, interesting question. What do you think the Bible says? Because it's not about me and what I'm saying. Well, let's go to the word. Let's see what it says, right? And so that would be one of those questions that I will refuse to answer, <laughs> but I will, but I will do my best to bring them to, to the word and say, well, what does the word say? All right. And let it be the word saying it, not me, right? Jesus said, he, he that rejects you has rejected me. He that rejects me has rejected my word. And the word that I've given to you will judge him on the last day. John 12 and verse 48. The word of God will judge us. I'll come to Lillian. I wanted to make a comment regarding Stephen calling them you stiff-necked people. If you go back to why they brought him before the Sanhedrin court... Back in the sixth chapter in the 13th verse, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. So just as a reminder to focus on the context. And we have. I, I want to put it in my words. Go ahead. These people set themselves up to be holy and righteous. They are before, they brought him before this esteemed court led by the high priest. So Stephen goes back and gives them a very good historical account of who they are as a people. By the time he gets to calling them a stiff-necked people, he is basically saying everything that you stand for is a contradiction to who you hold yourself out to be. He tells them that you are just like your ancestors. I mean, these people have been waiting for the righteous one to come to redeem them back to God, to be the one and the only true lamb of God, whereby all could be saved. But the promise was given to Abraham and then was opened up to all people. And he talked, he asked them the question, was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? You are following in the way of your ancestors. They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now he is holding out to them the very one you had been looking for, the very one you had hoped would liberate you. You have now even betrayed and murdered him. And so my point is, while they were offended undoubtedly by his characterization of them, but he summed up with them, you are no different from your ancestors. You have continued in a way, despite you supposedly being among the no, again, the high priest led the Sanhedrin, you still were deceived. And when someone tells you the very fabric of your existence is a contradiction to who you claim to serve, that can be quite disturbing. And again, always a lesson for us. Sure. Um, it's similar when you encounter the religious people of today. You start pointing out the truth to them. Some of them don't receive it very well. You know. Uh, I've, I've deal with with uh, you know people in different religions 
uh, that have rejected um, what the word says. As a matter of fact, I <laughs> when I deal with people that <clears throat> that are stiff net, that they will not listen to to the word. I do not just let them go. I tell them who they are and what they think. I I tell them uh, like this this one guy. Um, there was a, a, a reel on, on social media where this guy builds an entire tithe doctrine from the Old Testament, you know, and, and I was like, and he was binding it and, and I was like, wow, that's a lot of views. And so I just comment on there, you know, New Testament Christianity don't practice tithing. And then the comments start coming in, right? <laughs> the comments start coming in. And they, and they say, well, New Testament don't have Facebook, so you shouldn't be using Facebook. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, and, and I mentioned to them hermeneutics. And, and one guy there, um, the guy that said that New Testament also said don't have Facebook. I, I just said, you have a hermeneutical problem. And if you are willingly ignorant, I can't help you. And I just tell them that. And and that's just, just being straightforward uh, um, with them and giving them something to think about. Hey, what's this word hermeneutic? Maybe I should look it up. All right. They'll look it up as, oh, it's about interpreting the Bible, interpreting it correctly. All right. And so it's it's a similar behavior that we see today. The Jews demonstrated that here, and that's why we make the application of the context, right? We cannot be like so. We cannot be stiff necked when it comes to the word of God. Because um, then we're not rejecting the messengers. We're rejecting God. Right? We're rejecting his word. And so that's the first point of, of uh, application I wanted to draw from the text is verse 51. The second is verse 52. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold of the coming just one, of whom now you have become betrayers and murderers. What happened to all the prophets that God sent to this people? Oh, if we go back to specifically the time of the carrying away, right? The, the time of the destruction of the nation. Um, the prophets that God sent to them, eventually they killed. Uh, some of them were, were warned. Destruction is coming. They returned and they said, well, where are our prophets? And our prophets said, there's no dis dis destruction. There's peace, there's peace. We'll be in peace. And next thing you know, they're surrounded by the Babylonian army and they got carried away. And Jesus uh, made that point also in his sermon on the mountain. If you want to go there with me, in the Beatitude, the very last one, verse 11. Jesus says, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. So he's saying that to the audience that is before him, referencing the prophets that already died. All right. He says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And what would be the lesson to us or more of a reminder to us? If you think that you can get away with preaching the truth without offending anyone, you're wrong. <laughs> when you preach the truth... You will offend people. Jesus offended the Pharisees and the scribes. At one point, the disciples said to Jesus, Jesus, 
Did you not realize you offended the spiritual leaders? <laughs> Where the truth hurts, we say. But it's truth. It hurts. If you preach the truth, if you live your life following Jesus, you will be hated. You will be persecuted. You will be lied about, cheated, and, and mistreated by those who don't follow Jesus. Right? And so, so the reminder is, don't be surprised. That's what Jesus is saying. Blessed are you when they do this, because they did the same thing to the prophets. It's still true today. All right? Paul said in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, what did he say? Shall what? Shall suffer persecution. All right. Now, I've said this before. We're not suffering persecution. <laughs> that may be an indication of how we're living. It may be we're not living godly in Christ Jesus. It may be because the world recognizes us as her own. That we don't stand out, we stand in. Right? That we don't stick out like someone different. We're just like the world. Again, Jesus said you are the salt. Again, uh, uh, Ren's lesson this morning on influence People will recognize you as a Christian. Some will, a few will love you for it. The majority will hate you for it, All right? Pride month today, you, you dare say anything about God's promise? Uh, it's pride month the whole month. Can't believe how, how evil this nation has become in celebrating sin. All right, just a day for the veterans, just a day for Memorial Day, just a day for fathers and mothers. Is there a Christian month? There will never be. Let me tell you, there will never be. The Christian way of life has been under attack from the beginning, it predates this country's birth. Right. So, yeah, there will be a month for pride. If we keep going, there might be months for different uh, parts of celebrating pride. You know, maybe month for the homosexuals, month for the lesbians, month for, I mean, the way it, things are going. Where are the Christians? Where are God's people? One of the things we've been guilty of, guilty of, one of the sins we've been guilty of, is silence. Are there moments to be silent as a Christian? Yes. But I think we've been silenced in the wrong areas where we need to speak up. Right? But maybe we fear the persecution. Jesus said, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. Stephen goes on to die. And where did he end up? <laughs> Stephen dies after this stoning and the angels carried him into Abraham's bosom. Worth it. All right? Worth it. So, again, number one, don't be stiff neck. Listen to God's word that's coming from behind me going forward. Number two, remember, you follow Jesus, you will be persecuted. Because all of those who follow God have been persecuted. And then going back to Acts chapter 7.
in verse uh, 53, who have received the law by the de direction of angels and have not kept it. There is a misunderstanding of the word legalism. All right. When you hear the word legalism, or when you call somebody a legalist, what, what do you think people have in mind when they use that term? Or when they call someone a legalist? Follow the law, right? You legalist, you follow the law. And some people have believed that that's legalism in the Bible. It's the furthest from the Bible. Legalism in the Bible is not following the law. <laughs> legalism in the Bible was what the Pharisees did. In vain, Jesus said of them, in vain, this people worship me. All right. They draw near to me with their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. In vain they worship me. And then he says this, teaching for doctrines the commandments of God. Is that what he said? The commandments of men. When someone's a legalist, by definition, they don't obey God. But we have turned the ones that said, but this is what it says. And then we said, you Bible pointer, you legalist. But this is what the word says. We should follow it. You legalist. Sometimes we say, well, well when, you, when someone is following rules or following lists, all right? And they are not going to bend the list. Like take, for example, the, the qualifications of elders. That they will not, and we will not bend at any of the qualifications. Got to meet all of them. You know what people sometimes say? Oh, you're such a stickler. You, you legalist. Following that list. Crossing your... Your T's and dotting your eyes. <laughs> All right. You self righteous. Self righteousness defined in the Bible is when one ignores the word of God and do things his or her own way. Romans 10, go there with me. This is self righteousness. When you want to do it your way. Instead of God's way. Romans chapter 10. Paul said to his brethren. Brethren my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel. Is that they may be saved. I want my people to be saved. Paul says. Then he said this about them. For I bear them witness. That they have a seal for God. They are passionate. They want. To be God's people. They want to follow God. For they have a zeal for God but not according to knowledge. It's not according to what God said. All right? In other words, they passionately doing things, but they have this zealous to do things their way, not God's way. So they're legalists in that sense. And he continues on and says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness. The psalmist said, your commandments are righteousness. Psalm 119, verse 172. The commandments of God are righteousness. Here Paul says, they being ignorant of God's righteousness. In other words, ignorant of God's commandments. They did not know the word of God. Jesus said to the Sadducees, you do err not knowing the scriptures. Right, they come to Jesus, they try to trap him. Jesus, a brother dies, who, and the law, our leveret law says that his, 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 uh, uh, his brother next to him must marry his wife. And if he dies, the brother next to him must 
so to, to perpetuate his name for the seed. And then they asked Jesus on the resurrection, which wife will she be? Who will she belong to? The first brother, the second brother, the third brother, the fourth brother. Jesus said, you're ignorant. You don't know the law. Doesn't he say often to them, have you not read? The Pharisees were legalists. They didn't follow the law. They didn't obey the law. They do things their own way. Paul says here, for they being ignorant of God's righteous, seeking to establish their own righteousness. What do we call that? Self-righteousness. Do it my way. And I'm not submitted to the righteousness of God. What was the problem in the book of Romans? What was the, the apostle Paul was trying to convince people to do? He was trying to convince them, look, the law had its role to point out sin. Romans chapter 7. God gave the law for that purpose. Is the law then bad because it revives sin? He said, God forbid. I would not know sin if the law did not tell me that adultery was wrong, that murder was wrong, that lying was wrong, that, that saying God's name in vain was wrong. He said, there's a purpose of the law. But that law pointed to Christ, Romans 8.1. For there is now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but according to the spirit. What was Paul's point to the Jews there? Stop holding to this law, the traditions you've made, or the commandments that came from the intertestament period. Acts chapter 7, verse 8, that very last ending there, it, it reveals that problem over and over with the Jews. It's not that they were keepers of the law. They didn't follow it. They received it. There were, I will say some praise for them. There was a point where they were faithful in keeping it. But by the time of Jesus, it was, it was all motions and Obedience to man's traditions instead of God's law. I'll go to Pat and then I'll come back to Lillian. Go ahead, uh, Pat. You mentioned about us Christians being silent when we should be speaking. I have a comment about our election process in the United States where we have the right to vote. As Christians, we should evaluate what the belief system of that candidate that we are voting in the office. As we know now, the, de the deterioration of our culture where there is so much abortion going on every place in the United States where they make it a right. And there is no such thing as the right to abort if you go to the Bible, but so many of our leaders, not to mention the president of the United States, approving of abortion, this is very wrong. As Christians, we should know who we are voting into office. The, as Christians were called to hold fast to what is good. Right? Not who is good, not who presents themselves to be good, <laughs> but what is good. Now, that is hard to do when you're voting. <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say about that, because I know that politics is a dividing point. So I always emphasize that. What is good? Promote it. Hold fast to it. Right? Can, can a candidate make himself look good and deceive people? Yes. Right? So, so we have to uphold what is good. 
and stay away from what is not good. And the challenge when you're voting is on both sides, there's a lot of good and a lot of bad. So I leave that to you. I think everybody in here would agree that abortion is not good. That racism is not good. That lying is not good. We're a child, we're children of the kingdom. We're children of the king. We would know what is good and what is bad. And so hard to, to put in a quote unquote good leader because it's hard to know for sure if it's true, if the, if that's really good or not. And you, you could say you can tell by their fruit. And yeah, in some way. But we are God's nation. And we, we, we should be the, and I'm not talking about the United States. I'm talking about the church. We are God's nation. And we should be the light to the United States. This nation, the church, should be the light to the nation of the United States. All right. Uh, Lillian, you will have the honor of the last comment. When we examine the master teacher, it is very interesting to see who he gave strong rebuke to. If you go back and look at the people he interacted with and gave strong rebuke to, almost invariably, they held themselves out to be righteous. Regarding legalism versus pleasing God, principally speaking, the Pharisees were legalistic, in, especially in that they wanted to hold the master teacher to the letter of the law. And I'm thinking about the scenario whereby he healed the man on the Sabbath. Again, there was a message Jesus wanted to send to those who dare, to, dare hold other people to the letter of the law. But the heart of the matter in terms of having a God-fearing heart and a loving heart towards humanity uh, sets apart legalism versus pleasing God. Let's close with a prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And thank you for this time that we have to study, Lord, and, and allow your word to, to remind us, Father, to look within us, to examine our hearts, uh, to be humble at heart, to allow you to mold us through your word and help us, Father, to, to have that humble heart uh, that is open to, to everything that we need, to instruction, to rebuke, to correction, uh, to encouragement. Help us also, Lord, to, to realize that if we suffer for doing right, that the glory is yours, that you be glorified, and that we should consider those opportunity in great joy, uh, knowing that we suffer like our Lord suffered. And Father, help us to be doers and not hearers of your word only. Be with us now, Father, as we prepare to worship you in spirit and truth. May all that we say, do, and think be pleasing before you this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.